All right. Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, uh, this is going to be another one of those episodes where it's not planned. I just record it because I told people, hey, if you send me a bottle that you want me to review, if you're like, hey, this is one of my favorite whiskeys, I love it, and you send it to me, I will try it, and I will tell you on the channel what I think about it. D. Mendez, my man, sent me Hill Rock Estate. This is um, a Solera aged bourbon whiskey. It says, uh, it's a Napa Cabernet cask, single cask. That's pretty cool. It's been proofed down a little bit, so it's a single cask, but it is 46.3% AB, ABV, which means we're looking at 92.6 proof on this bad boy. I gotta say, out the gate, the bottling is beautiful. What do I know about Hill Rock? Not a lot. <laughs> Not a lot. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know a lot about Hill Rock out of the gate. Uh, it's distilled in the uh, Hudson Valley, New York. I have never tried anything from Hill Rock, ever. My knowledge about Hill Rock is limited to one obscure fact, and that's that they are old school in one, uh, one way. They still floor malt their malt. Okay, so they still floor malt very old school in that capacity. Beyond that, I don't know much about them. So it's kind of exciting for me to try stuff like this because I don't have a predisposition towards it, right? There's no, I don't have any like knowledge and reviews that I've read and all that stuff sort of as an underlying factor when I taste it. I have nothing. So I'm going to go into this basically completely blind. I don't know if people love it, if they hate it, or somewhere in between. I'm just going to drink it and tell you what I think about it. Sound good? So D. Mendez, hey. Thanks, brother, for sending me this. I know you jumped through several hoops to get this here to me, and for that, I thank you. So, I have not even popped the seal on it. It is still, you can still see it is completely sealed. I'm going to pop it now. You'll get my, you'll get my unfiltered uh, initial thoughts on this. I got to say, the bottling is really cool. So, they did a good job with the branding. Give them props where it's due. All right. As far as wines go, I'm not a wino, but I do like Cabernets. That much I do know. I'm a dry red guy when it comes to wines. We'll give ourselves a decent pour here. Hill Rock Estate, Solera Aged Whiskey. It is a bourbon, straight up. I'll have to do some. Um, I'll have to do some research if I. I'll tell you this. If I can find a mash bill for this, I'll put it on the screen. Hey, quick time out. So in further research, a couple of quick updates in the middle of this video that I think are important to provide context for the rest of it. I learned two things that are important. One, they do not disclose their mash bill. It's undisclosed. So we don't know how much is corn, how much is rye, how much is malted barley, whatever. We don't know it. Uh, the next thing that's very important is the idea of a Solera aging um, process. It's not traditional. So what they do is kind of complex. So in order for it to be called bourbon, it has to be aged in new charred oak barrels. But they don't have a label of it being straight bourbon. So in other words, it's got a no age statement. It can be called bourbon, but it can't be called straight. It's, it spends a, an unspecified amount of time in that charred oak barrel, which is very short. They probably like put it in that charred oak barrel and, you know, it could be just a couple of months for all we know before they empty it. And then they put it in a different barrel and then it enters what's called the Solera aging process where the barrel is filled. And then what they're going to do over time is they're going to empty a little bit of it and put new whiskey on top to fill it. It's going to age. They're going to empty a little bit of it and then refill a little bit more whiskey on top. So it's never fully drained. So that barrel continues to interact with different whiskeys and different batches uh, over a considerable amount of time. That's why there's no age statement on the whiskey itself. So I just wanted to provide a little context for this uh, before continuing my review of it because I learned this after the fact and I wanted to make sure that I included it in the video for your knowledge because I thought it was important for my own. Let's get back to it. But uh, I'm going into this completely blind and we'll see uh, what I can pick out of this. On the nose, this reminds me a lot of Driftless Glen, 
which is a Wisconsin bourbon, not a Kentucky bourbon. But it, it on the nose, it's a lot like that. The only fr- uh, Driftless Glen I have currently on my shelf is not their standard bourbon. It's actually a um, Valencia uh, orange-infused sherry cask finish bourbon. And this reminds me of that in a lot of ways. A little bit of fruit up front, those sweet red fruits, but also plenty of caramel and a crisp, like, refreshing kind of a vibe, too. Somewhat floral. I mean, I could smell bourbon all day, though. Like, any good bourbon. I could just sit there. I could just stick my nose in it and just breathe it in all day. And I would consider that time well spent, you know? All right, let's go in on this, D. Now, I know you love this. I will I will um, try not to let the fact that you are a good friend and a faithful supporter, uh, I will try not to let that influence what I taste and how I how much I like this. I know this is a favorite of yours. And that's why you were excited to get it to me. But I'm going to try to be honest and objective here. Wow, that palate is not like the nose in a lot of ways. I expected a real caramely palate. I get cinnamon and fig. Cinnamon and fig are like the two most predominant flavors I get on that. Maybe even a little bit of ginger. It's very forward on the palate. Right, it doesn't sit there and leave you guessing. Like, hmm, what am I getting there? Like, it's just like, I'm going to be honest with you, this is what I am. That is what this is. It doesn't leave any room for guessing. This one says it's a Cabernet cask. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this retails uh, like just under 100 bucks. Like... Depending on where you're at, you're looking at 80 to $90. So I'm not going to lie to you, that's a pretty steep price point. I mean, at that price point, you've got a lot of competition. But um, that's one of the things I think that uh, these craft distillers do really well, is they can compete at price points that are a little unorthodox because they bring something that's a little bit more unique to the table. You know what I'm saying? And so for a Cabernet cask, finished six-year bourbon there's not a lot of competition out there you know what i mean so they're bringing you something that's going to be a little bit unique to your palate something you haven't quite experienced before and um you know what's really interesting i've been doing a ton of research a ton of reading there's several books um i mean some of them are right here on the on the tabletop because i sit here at night when I'm, i'm like i'm too tired to do anything but I'm not tired enough to go to bed yet. I'll sit here on my couch. I'll have myself a pour. And I'll do some reading. And what I'm reading is like books on flavor creation and whiskey. How it's done. Start to finish. Different authors bringing their expertise to the table and telling me about the process. From mash to bottling and everything in between. How flavor is created in whiskey. And I find it fascinating to see how different authors approach it from different uh, standpoints. But uh, anyways, one thing that is pretty universally agreed upon, and this might blow some minds, and that's that um, the finishing barrel, there's more influence on the whiskey from the wood than there is from the alcohol that was in that barrel. So let me explain it this way. If you see that a, a whiskey you're drinking was finished in an Oloroso sherry barrel, you're expecting to get sherry flavors in the whiskey because the barrel that it, that it was finished in once contained Oloroso sherry and then you may say you may see a different whiskey that was finished in a cabernet barrel and you're thinking i'm going to get cabernet flavors in my whiskey but you're missing something most of the flavor that's going to be imparted on the whiskey from that finishing barrel is not actually from the cabernet at all It's from the barrel itself. What kind of wood was it? Where did it come from? How many times has it been used? And so wines especially, like sherry, cabernets, etc. They're a lot easier on the barrel. They don't strip a ton out of it, right? Because they're not like really high in proof like say a whiskey is. So the second time you use a bourbon barrel, right? Say you put bourbon in a barrel, aged it, and and then you emptied that barrel... And you send it off to Scotland and they age their scotch in that barrel. 
the bourbon took a lot out of that barrel. It took a lot of color, took a lot of flavor, and it left behind more subtle flavors. But something like a Cabernet or a Sherry, it's not going to be so harsh on that wood. It's not going to strip it of a ton of color and a ton of flavor. It's going to be a lot softer on it. So there's going to be a lot left behind for the whiskey to grab. So the question here is not necessarily what was the Cabernet like. My question is, what was the barrel like that the Cabernet was in? Because that barrel is giving us more flavor than the Cabernet left behind in the barrel. You know what I'm saying? So when you see that a, a whiskey was finished in a barrel of some kind, um, you are going to get some flavors from what was in that barrel first. If it was Sherry or Cabernet, you're going to get some of that. But most of the flavor that comes from that second barrel is actually the barrel itself. So, what's what was in that barrel first actually tells us a lot about what we're going to be getting out of it. If I know that it's a wine, I know there was a lot left in that wood. And if that wood was from like a European barrel in Spain, hey, European wood is more tannic, you know, has a lot more uh, of those strong woody flavors left behind. So, that's really interesting stuff to me. I know it sounds kind of nerdy. It really does. But it's really interesting to me. Now, we know that this was finished. It says in a Napa Cabernet. So how is that important? What does that tell us about the whiskey? This was a Napa Valley Cabernet. Chances are pretty good. It was actually white oak, white American oak, which offers different flavors. It lends itself to different flavor profiles. And they tend to be sweeter, less dry, less tannic, more caramely vanilla e, And I talked about this a little bit in my uh, barrel influence video, which I posted very recently. Now, that doesn't mean that it is certainly white oak. We would have to uh, ask the distiller to disclose that information. But chances are very good that this is not European oak if it was a Napa Valley, California wine. You know what I'm saying? And I think both the nose and the palate would confirm that for me. Because I was getting raisin and fig, but also vanilla and caramel. And it's a great combination. That's really tasty. I like that. So, is this a buy? That's a good question. Now, I can't tell you what your money is worth. That's up to you. I can tell you what this is like and let you make a decision based on your palate and your preferences. I can tell you that this is delicious, and I'm glad it was sent to me. At that $100 price point, you can get, you know, a fair number of 10-year bourbons. I mean, you think of like Widow Jane 10-year. Yeah, there's, there's tons of them. Eagle Rare is, you know, half the price, if not a little less. I mean, I got my bottle, my current bottle of Eagle Rare, I spent 33 bucks on. 33 bucks is a 10-year bourbon. So, this is closer to a hundred year, a hundred dollars, and it's six years. So you have to keep that in mind. It's a younger whiskey at a higher price point, but it does bring something to the table, and that's that it was finished. This one, at least, in a Cabernet barrel, and that's going to create a completely different tasting experience for you. But I think it's quite tasty. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Mr. Mendez, for sending this over to me. I really appreciate you, brother, and your consistent support on all my various channels, gaming, whiskey, whatever they may be. And thanks to all my Patreon supporters, uh, especially thank you so much because you justify the time I spend making these videos because this is not my main channel, and uh, it's just it's my hobby, and I love it, and I really enjoy making these videos. But you guys help me justify the time spent on it. So thank you so much, Patreon supporters. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like on it. Let me know if you've ever had this, what you think about it. If you haven't had it, let me know in the comments section what you think about it based on my description of it. If this is something that you might be interested in or if this is a pass for you, let me know. And look forward to catching you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.